from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Christian Espinosa joining me from Arizona in the U.S., Christian, thank you very much for being with me on the show today. The way I love to do it is I ask my guests to introduce themselves because I believe no one else can do an introduction for someone better than themselves. So the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks for having me on, Mim, and I appreciate it. So I'm Christian Espinoza. I like risk in a venture. Done about 300 skydives. I like anything that involves a waiver where you get to sign a waiver. That means you could possibly lose your arm or die. I'm sort of attracted to risky activities. Um, I've done 24 Ironman triathlons, and maybe the fact that I'm attracted to risky activities uh, has made me want to become an entrepreneur. So I've been an entrepreneur for about 15 years. I was a solopreneur for a while. I, I used to be in the um, Air Force, the US military for a while. and I built and sold one cybersecurity company, and I have a new cybersecurity company now called Blue Goat Cyber. So I figured with this company, I can, uh, this new company, Blue Goat Cyber, I can avoid a lot of the dumb tax, I like to say, that I paid in my first company. Um, <clears throat> I currently live in Arizona. I travel around quite a bit. I was just in Dubai uh, last week in an Abu Dhabi, a little bit before that for the Formula One race. I like. Formula One, I like world travel. I've been to about 70 countries. Um, I've written two books. My second book was just published uh, today, actually. And uh, my first book was really about my entrepreneurial journey. It's called The Smartest Person in the Room. It's about my journey with my first cybersecurity company. Because one of the things I realized in my company was most of the problems I had in the company were not because my staff lacked technical skills. It was really because they lacked people skills or emotional intelligence. So I, I, I work to train my staff and add that EQ skills to already high IQ individuals in my company. And that's what I wrote about in my first book. That's great. And thank you again, Christian, for being with me today. Um, you know, maybe first question that came to my mind, <clears throat> and you are in risk, so maybe I can relate, but why do you choose as an entrepreneur to take the path of cybersecurity. And knowing that, Christian, um, it's not an easy one, right? It's, it's, it's something with a lot of up and downs and it needs a lot of dedication. What, what attracted you to be in, in that domain? When I got out of the US military, I, I wanted to have options for my career, for my commercial career. And in the military, I did information insurance or cybersecurity. It was a little bit different back then. But I saw a progression that cybersecurity was going to become more and more and more uh, in demand. So I focused on getting cybersecurity certifications. And my first job was doing security when I got in the military. And I just kind of built my career around that. Uh, I, I realized from an entrepreneur perspective, sometimes I think, Maybe I should do a different business uh, where it's not quite as challenging because the bottom line in cybersecurity is most people don't care about cybersecurity unless there's a compliance driver, uh, like some sort of regulation. Like in the U.S., we have HIPAA, the FDA, or some driver that makes somebody have to do cybersecurity. That's one reason. The other reason is that they've already had a data breach. So it's kind of a, a hard thing to sell because people don't really want it. Uh, unless they're required to have it or they've learned their lesson a little bit with a data breach. So it is a challenging industry, but I feel like with this company uh, now, like I mentioned before in the intro, I can fast forward it because 
I paid a lot of that dump tax with my first company. My first company, when I started it, I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't know anything about marketing. I just thought I'll build a company and clients will come. Kind of like that movie, Fill the Dreams, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> you, have to, you have to create a funnel and get people to understand your brand and network and do a lot of things to keep uh, the sales coming in. Yeah, funny enough, you know, when I talk to CISOs, you know, and I ask them, of course, like, <clears throat> because I can, I can ask, you know, from, I would say, like, a neutral perspective or someone who's not going and trying to sell them necessarily a product. And they always tell me, you know, like, when someone from a cybersecurity company calls us, as you said, you know, it's like, you know, the insurance guy who's phoning you, you know that you need it, but actually you don't want to do it, so... Pretty much, it's like very, very common, I think, across the board. Now, you mentioned, Christian, about a couple of things that forces usually companies to buy cybersecurity mm -hmm. products. And you've been like in this for a long time and you had, you know, your previous company and the current company. But of course, there will be, you mentioned two drivers. One is compliance and one is data breaches. But mm -hmm. in your opinion, when, you know, as, as a decision maker in a company, right? And I'm saying as from client perspective, what do you think, you know, are the priorities that really drives me as, as a CISO or even CIO to go to my board and say, guys, if we don't do this, you know, this is the risk. This is what we got, what's going to happen. And the reason I'm asking you, because I hear a lot, you know, and I see a lot of articles that, their biggest struggle is because they need to spend money on something not tangible. So from your experience, how these leaders can take this message and convert it to some terms that the board would be able to understand? That's uh, one of the biggest challenges. I, I think you mentioned insurance. Cybersecurity is kind of like insurance. Uh, you know, you, you don't realize you need it until you need it, but it's good to have it. So one of the challenges we have with CISOs and, and technical leaders is they often were promoted from a technical background and they don't understand how to communicate in terms of the business uh, objectives, in terms of strategy for the business, in terms of risk reduction. So it often sounds like technical jargon. And I think when if I'm on the board or I'm the CEO and someone's explained to me a bunch of technical jargon that I don't understand, uh, it, it doesn't tie into how it's going to help the business, then I'm probably not going to want to do it. Uh, I, I think it's important that CISOs have great communication skills and they can talk and posture cybersecurity in terms of aligning with the business objectives and maturing in alignment with the business objectives. And it is... And it, it is uh, not necessarily a tangible thing, but the, if you don't do it, the results can be tangible and devastating. Like over 60% of small businesses that have a data breach go out of business. Uh, and for me as an entrepreneur, I know how hard it is to build a business. And I would hate for someone's small business to go out of business because of, because of a data breach. So if you have a little bit of the statistics and the background and you can communicate better, I think a CISO would be would be better positioned to help the company with cybersecurity. Yeah, that's great. And to your point, actually, Chris, especially for, and this is, I repeated on the show multiple times, because unfortunately, people think that the bad actors goes after the big names, the mm -hmm. big enterprise only, but it's not the case. And I tell them, guys, already as an entrepreneur, but the moment your startup is born, it's a percentage of staying alive after one year is 10%. <laughs> so, yes. and then, and then, you know, this is based on statistics, like startups stated that they can survive more than one year, just is like 10%. And it's becoming more hard and hard, you know, and don't let, you know, something, an event, a cybersecurity event, even shrink this 10% to maybe like 0.001% because, you know, mm -hmm especially if you're writing code, you have your IP in place, you have, you know, whatever, if you are inventing something, maybe you have patent or whatever. So you need still to protect. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. So this is 100%, uh, you know, I agree with you on this point. 
Now, I would love to, you know, if you can elaborate, and you wrote about it, you know, the first book about the seven step secure methodology, you know, if you can explain to me and to the audience and how it transformed technical leaders into more effective communicators and leaders, actually. The seven steps I wrote about in the smartest person in the room were really the things that worked in my company. Uh, and it's, it's a, a framework or a methodology to help somebody progress with people's skills. Like step one is awareness. Uh, and I think we all need to have awareness before we can change anything. I'm not a believer that knowledge is power. I think awareness or knowledge doesn't matter unless you can do something with it. And in the book, I, I use a lot of neuro-linguistic programming or NLP concepts. And, and one of them is that our brains uh, are, have neuroplasticity. We can change our, our behavior. Mm -hmm. From an awareness perspective, we, we're very programmatic. We like to think we're, we're unpredictable, but humans are very programmatic. It's like a program that runs. So there's a trigger, and we run this program, and automatically, before we know it, the program is over. We didn't even realize what we just did. So from an awareness perspective, if that behavior or that program is not serving you, it's important to be able to do a control C or stop that program and then run a different program. And the new program will become the default behavior over time. Uh, and that's something a lot of people, they don't understand. They just think that they're very uh, unpredictable and they can't change things. So that's step one. Step two is mindset. Uh, there's really two types of mindset. And I got this concept a little bit from Carol Dweck's book. There's a growth mindset and a fixed mm -hmm. mindset. We want to have a growth mindset, which means we believe we can change. If we have a fixed mindset, we believe our brain is hardwired and we're, we're just the way we are. In my industry, a lot of people will say, I'm, I'm just not good with people. That's the example of a fixed mindset. And I usually ask people, well, what would happen if you got better interacting with people? And they think about it and they say, well, my life would probably improve. And if they can take those steps, uh, that would be a growth mindset. And then step three is acknowledgement. Uh, one of the things I realized as a leader, uh, and it took me a while to realize this, is I had a hard time acknowledging myself for accomplishing anything or doing hard things. I remember in 2005, I stood under the Ironman World Championship finish line. I, I was just went there to watch the race. And I told myself, I would do the race one day. And then 10 years later, I did it. And I remember crossing the finish line. I, I never like once took a second, like pat myself on the back or acknowledge that I did something for me 10 years. I was automatically thinking about the next thing. And I realized <clears throat> if I had this problem myself that it's going to show up in my interactions with my staff or my team. So that's something I, I, I worked on quite a bit as well. Because everybody wants to be, uh, they want to feel appreciated and understood. Um, and acknowledged. Uh, then step four is communication, which we talked about a little bit with this, the CISOs and try to get a budget in cybersecurity. This is a massive problem in my industry. I think it's a massive problem in society anyway. Uh, but I'm a proponent that the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you're communicating with someone and you're not getting the budget, you're not getting, they're not understanding, they're not taking the action you want to take. The ownership shifts to you to alter how you communicate. Typically, what we do is we blame the other person rather than alter how we communicate. Uh, I know I'm a big proponent of uh, taking ownership of that communication. So step five is monotasking. So monotasking is the opposite of multitasking. Uh, we've been kind of brainwashed today to multitask, uh, which when we multitask, we're very busy, but not very productive. We're also very stressed out because we're always waiting for to respond to something. Uh, and every time we switch from one task to another one, that context switching causes us to sometimes mix up the tasks we're doing and lose efficiency. The monotasking helps with productivity and it also helps with communication because if you're monotasking when you're communicating with someone, you're being present. That means you're not thinking about anything else. You're not checking your phone. 
you're present, which makes you a better communicator as well. And then step six is empathy. Uh, in our society today, there's a lot of division. Uh, there's the, you know, the pro-vacciners, the anti-vacciners, the Democrats, Republicans, you know, there's all this division. And it's hard to be empathetic when we only see division. Um, and we all have the human condition in common. And if we step back and realize that the person we're communicating with or we're interacting with probably has a lot of the similar struggles as we do, it's much easier to be empathetic. Uh, and, and this is something that I had last year, in February, I, I developed blood clots in my left leg and <clears throat> had to go to the hospital. And the doctor came out finally and, and told me I had six blood clots in my left leg. And I asked him what it meant. And he said I could, he said it meant I could die or like have a stroke at any moment. So I was kind of freaked out as there by myself. And it's interesting because what he said is, he said, oh, don't worry. I see this all the time. And, and I was like, you know, I was like silently crying in there and I was like thinking if I die. And I, I said, well, I don't. This is, a, this is a first for me. So I think from an empathy perspective, he saw himself as the, the doctor, me as the patient, again, that divide versus I'm just a fellow human being going through something pretty difficult here. Maybe he could show some empathy. And I think he was trying to show empathy. It just didn't come across the way. And then the last step is Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese word that means constant and never ending improvement or can I. The whole concept is any of these steps you're working on or anything in life, uh, you need to have the courage to take the first step. And if you adapt the philosophy of Kaizen, that means as long as you're making improvements, that's what matters. We're not going to master something overnight. A lot of people will start a new program or a new fitness routine or try to improve in the relationship. And they'll go, go after it for like a month. And if it doesn't work out, they just go back to the way things were without realizing that this is a journey and mastery takes time. And you know, we never really master anything. I mean, I'm still going to be working on things until pretty much you know, I die. So it's like this constant search for improvement, really. You know, those are the, the seven steps from high, very high level, of course. Amazing, Christian. And actually a lot, actually all of them, they resonated to me because, um, but you know, the, the, the point that, or the step that resonated with me is maybe the last one. We're living in a time also where people want to all of a sudden become one of these known names, right? Um, so, and unfortunately it's, you know, like it's, it's being irritating, honestly, like if I want to be like a little bit polite to not say anything, I just, <laughs> Where, where, you know, we are seeing this culture of people, hey, like, do this and you become that. It's not like mm -hmm. this. It's just like, it needs to, to spend time. It takes a lot of time. But to your point, and this is something, you know, I, I learned it the hard way also as well. So, because, you know, when I was younger, you know, like I wanted to do things fast and I want to, and I want to do progresses in a much faster way until I start to read these books and, you know, a lot of books that, Covered the Kaizen and, you know, similar people who talks about similar concept that, okay, guess what? You just need to do small steps and, you know, these small steps will, will, will become like after a couple of weeks, months, years, those big steps that you wanted to take. So you need to give right. yourself the time, you know, to reach there. And this applies, the nice thing about that, it applies to many things in life, including careers, including, you know, leadership, including everything. So really these seven steps, Christian, I think they are a cornerstone, not for only technology people or cybersecurity people. I think it applies across the board, right? Yeah. I, I mean, my book is really probably a, a personal development book uh, framed in the context of my career with cybersecurity. If we had to like distill it down to, to what it's yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Now, you know, I don't want to spend much on cybersecurity, honestly, but again, you know, because uh, this is, <laughs> it's okay, we talk about every day. So, you know, I want to hear your opinion as an entrepreneur as well. And because you mentioned something very, 
it's it's a, it's it's a lesson that everyone should learn from because you mentioned about your first startup and you know there was not like sales funnel and so on. Yes. Now, <clears throat> but there is I think a thin line, Christian, between exaggerating things in terms of what a solution can do and being you know, also at the same time, showing the empathy that you talked about just a few minutes ago mm -hmm. with the customer. I talk with a lot of people, you know, and from both sides, from vendor's perspective, from client's perspective, we see this happening all the time. Of course, we know, like, for example, ransomware is the biggest threat that everyone talks about today. And of course, data breaches. Now, leaders in, 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 in client side, like CISOs, CIOs, they are telling me, and actually they are telling everyone, we are not liking the way when these vendors, they come to us right after, you know, a major event happens and they try to pitch their solutions, mm -hmm. right? So how critical it is also to show the empathy as, as a provider to the customers, especially when, when we have, you know, on average, I think every, the last time I checked, I'm not sure if it changed, like I think we have a cybersecurity event every eleven every eleven seconds or so. So, <laughs> what what are what are your thoughts about that? I think it's extremely important to show that empathy. Uh, as I mentioned with my first cybersecurity company that I added the EQ skills um, I wrote about in the book, the people skills. Um, I that helped us with with communicating with the clients because. If you put yourself, and this is empathy as well, you put yourself in somebody else's shoes or you, you understand their perspective or try to understand it, 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 it changes your lens of how you view the scenario. And I think from a, a client perspective, if they've had a data breach or even they're trying to make a purchasing decision for cybersecurity, it's important to put yourself in their shoes. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I learned when I sold my company, I sold it to a my first company, I sold it to a publicly traded company. Uh, the culture was very different in the, the company that bought mine. And one of the, the staff on a company that helped respond to incidents like ransomware didn't have a lot of people skills. And he would frustrate the clients so much because he didn't understand their perspective. Uh, he didn't even try to understand. He had frustrated the clients so much that they didn't want to work with us. And it's ironic that that was the exact thing I tried to solve, or I did solve in my company, but then the company I sold mine to had, you know, a few challenges around that topic. So I think from a communication perspective, from a, a sales perspective, it's important to put yourself in the client's shoes. Even like for me, what I do, because I do sales quite a bit, is I look at who the person is we're interacting with. And from their perspective, they're probably talking to multiple vendors. And they work for the CEO typically, or they work for some other person high up in the company. They've been put in charge this task of making a purchasing decision. So they want to make sure they're making the right decision. Uh, and it's going to be a great experience. It's the right price. And they want to make sure that they recommend us to their boss that it is the right choice. So I always put myself in their shoes. because I, I think a lot of us only look at the world through our own perspective. And uh, that, that's why I said empathy is, seems to be a, a problem today when we have all this division and we think they're a client, I'm a vendor, you know, we're trying to sell something to them. It, it's, we, we need to just look at ourselves in a similar fashion. And here is the key. And I think the ones who uh, making the situations a win-win for everyone who comes as, I know like it's also a cliche, unfortunately, but really, when you go there as a trusted advisor mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, I work myself as a sales engineer and I know, you know, how the customer will appreciate when you try to not only solve the problem that your solution can, can offer to them, but try also to shed some lights on other things that maybe they are not seeing today. So this is what can tweak the whole conversation and mm -hmm. they stop to see you as someone who is after their money, <laughs> because yeah, at the end, you know, everything is, is, has to end with a transaction, business transaction. This is normal, but you know, like the customer, they, 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 from their perspective, they want to 
you know, see the value as well. And they need to see that you are not there just for taking the money and run away. So they want to see someone who would be standing with them. And, you know, this is again to the seven steps that you just mentioned, the empathy, the communication. I think mm -hmm. all these together, they can have, as you said, we are not all two sides. Actually, we are one team trying to solve problem together. I like this approach. Now, because you, you've done the entrepreneurship journey also as well, uh, Christian. So how did you balance, you know, risk taking? And I know that you love risk a lot <laughs> with, with, but at the same time, with, you know, the traditional things like strategic planning, you know, having proper forecast to the business, how it would be, especially and we know that cybersecurity can be sometimes be a very volatile field, right? So it can have its own up and down. So how, mm -hmm. how did you manage to do this, this balance? I think when I first started, I didn't have a lot of balance. I, I have a tendency to just um, jump into something and try to figure it out. And, and that worked for a while in my company, but at some point when you get to a certain size, you've got to systematize things a lot more. It's hard to scale when you're just trying to always figure things out. So I, I think one of the, the things that helped me the most in my company, uh, the, the one I sold was I did this thing called the one page strategic plan. So you basically get your core values, the sandbox you want to play in, uh, what your discriminators are, what your targets are all on one page and going to the exercise with my leadership team uh, really helped us narrow our focus and become more strategic. Because before what I did, which was a mistake, uh, is I thought everybody needs cybersecurity. So we try to sell to everybody. Uh, but when you sell to everybody, your messaging is watered down. And you don't really resonate with anybody. So after I did that one page strategic plan, I realized the sandbox, as I, as I call it, the area I wanted to play in uh, was medical device cybersecurity. That's what we were going to focus on. Not a lot of people were specialized in medical device cybersecurity. So we focused on the area, uh, which is more of a blue ocean strategy, as they say. There wasn't a lot of competition. And once we narrowed it down to one specific niche and only targeted that, our sales went up. So it's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive because a lot of, I think, entrepreneurs at the very beginning try to sell to everybody uh, versus, and they're afraid that if I narrow it down to a specific target, that I'm going to lose all this other opportunity out there. But the reality is if you narrow it down, niche it down, uh, your, your messaging is going to be much more clear. You can understand the pain points of that specific target and your sales are going to go up. And then once you kind of master that one area, then you can add another niche. Uh, and that, that took me a long time to figure out. And, and now uh, in this company, uh, Blue Gold Cyber, my new company, we're, we're again focused on medical device cybersecurity and a couple other things, but that is our main niche. Uh, and that's our main area of expertise. And again, that's like that blue ocean strategy I mentioned. I love that. Uh... You know, everything related to Blue Ocean, I'm a fan of that. Um, because the, the question I ask always, you know, when someone tries to approach me, whether they're trying to get me on board with them or they ask me, okay, can you promote our products or so on? I ask them this question, what's your Blue Ocean? And then a lot of people, I'm surprised they, they don't understand this. I said, what do you mean? I said, because right. look, if you're going to go and say the same messaging that a lot of people, or they are in the same, not only the messaging, I mean the solution that you're trying to, to solve a problem. If a lot of people are in the same field and maybe you have like only one or two like differentiators, like probably no one will, will, will listen to you because they'll tell you, hey, we have that solution today. Why right. we should change? So, so I love always, you know, and I like the way you, you niche down, you know, in, in, you said the medical devices, right? So which I'm sure that there's not, not a lot of, uh, layers in that area, which is then you can take it, you know, to the other one and uh, to the other, I would say vertical, whatever mm -hmm. that might be, and then you, you grow it. So 
uh, maybe back to, to the thing that you mentioned at the beginning, Christian, is, is to, to, to do the things in small steps and because you cannot become, let's say, I don't want to mention the security vendor name, but one of the biggest security vendors, you cannot become like this in one year. Like you, it might take with you 10 years until you right. stay. So, so this is where the vision, I believe, is very, very important. Now, I want to come to, to, to your recent book that, of course, by the time this will be out, I think it's next week, so today, 12th of December, is the date where we recorded this episode. So, you know, if, if you can walk me through, you know, because the title is very attractive, actually. So, uh, walk me through, you know, why you called it this way, the smartest person in the room and in the between. So, I know that you, you came to, to some of the, of, of the things you mentioned about, you know, the, the, the personal, uh, I would say, characteristics. But can you elaborate a little bit more and what, what exactly the message you want to convey with, with the book? This is with my uh, new book? Yes. Okay. So my, my, my new book, The In-Between, Life in the Micro, that's the title, uh, is, is sort of a focus memoir uh, on my life and where I feel like I've done things right and where I've messed them up. Uh, but it's, it's focused on what I call the in-between. So often we get very focused on some macro goal, some big target out there. And we get so focused on it, especially if you're an entrepreneur or a high achiever, that we lose sight of all the things between where we are and that goal. Uh, and, and those things, which are the micro moments I call, can actually inform us that maybe this goal we're going after is not the right goal. They, can, they may be able to help us get to that goal faster. And they, they are things that can enhance our lives and add fulfillment. And in the book, I write about the times that I've been focused on something, you know, macro, some big goal that I've ignored, like, you know, someone right in front of me uh, in a relationship, for instance, and then that relationship didn't work out. And it's because I was, I, I lost sight of what was important. You know, I, was, I, I got so obsessed with the, the big thing I was trying to accomplish. Uh, and th there's been times I've, I've done things right as well. So it's really my transformation of, of living life with some more intention on the small moments, the micro moments as I call them, and, and trying to keep hold of the vision and not the circumstance. So an example I give in the book is even if I'm like going to dinner uh, with my girlfriend, you know, if, if, you, if you set the intention before you go to dinner that we're gonna have a great time and it's a chance for us to connect, then the little things that happen, like if the waitress or the waiter messes up your order or there's a line or somebody spills something, they're not going to just derail you. So it's setting some intentions as well. So we have the ability to influence those small micro moments in, in, a, in a more positive manner as well. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, sorry, I, I mix the things up. And I'm sorry for that question. It's been, you're about the book before and this book. Yeah, so it's that's in okay. between. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that, that's, that's fine. So because, you know, like I, I thought that this is the latest one, but it's okay, like you, you just mentioned it. Now, when you look at your career and experiences, uh, Christian, what the impact that you hope, you know, you would be, leaving to the world, both as leader in cybersecurity and as a human being? Well, I think about this quite a bit because uh, I'm doing my second cybersecurity company. I also write books and I, I do speaking. And, and one of the things I, 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 I realized that I kind of infuse in everything I do is I think people, uh, they know Internally, they have this innate knowing of what they want to do or what they're capable of, but something happens in their life where they, they lose sight of that. So I want to help people uncover that and realize that they're capable of much more than they think they are. A lot of people kind of settle to a life of surviving versus thriving. So I, I, I want to help people uncover whatever is blocking them. 
and then also help to help them develop the courage to take a new step. And it could be in a completely different direction, but we only have, you know, one life. And I think about, you know, death quite a bit. And I always think if I died today or tomorrow, would I feel like I've done the best I could do in my life here? And I, I can say yes. But I think if you ask people a lot of questions, they're going to have regrets because they didn't take this risk. They didn't do that. They didn't do this. And I've read a lot of books with people like on their deathbed. And a lot of people have a lot of those regrets. So I'm hoping to, through my books, my leadership style, my, my talks, help people develop that courage to take the first step, take a different path, and a path that they know is for them. So I think if we tune into ourselves, we, we all have a calling if we actually listen. And I think a lot of us have learned to tune out that calling. So that, that's, that's what I feel my purpose is. That's amazing, uh, Christian. And, you know, just a, not a confession, but, you know, this is something I, I mentioned also multiple times. So I, I was late to, to, to take these actions. Um, but nevertheless, being late is better than not doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, for you know, mentioning this because I believe everyone has the potential to do something meaningful. Um, you know, and now with, you know, since beginning of, this, of the year 2023, so I started to do podcasts. So this is why I always, Christian, I'm after people like yourself who can inspire not only entrepreneurs, but, you know, anyone that mm -hmm. things can go in a, to a different direction. You don't have to accept uh, you know, your current situation. People talk about going out of your comfort zone. It's not like about comfort zone. It's about choosing another path that might put you in actually really a comfort zone because now you're sitting in a place which is not comfortable and you accept it as your comfort zone. So this is why this is very important to, to, to you know, take that. Now, as we close to an end, and I know you've done a lot of this uh, previously, Christian. Um, but I'm sure that you get a lot of questions from maybe younger entrepreneurs who want to start, you know, their journey. So mm -hmm. from your experience in entrepreneurship, so what are some of the advices you would give them uh, if they are just about to get started? I like to focus more on what we call them the first time founders, because these are the guys who never started their business before they have nothing they know about so what you can tell them from your experience i think one thing at least with me like you mentioned you got started a little bit later i got started later too i kind of ignored that innate um feeling or pull that i wanted to become an entrepreneur i, I got focused on uh, a nine to five job and stability and a house and all that stuff because i didn't I, I grew up in a very chaotic environment so i saw stability and safety for too long. So I, I think if somebody wants to be an entrepreneur or wants to found a start a business, I think it's important to actually understand what your drivers are because it's not going to be an easy journey. A lot of people think if you become an entrepreneur, you're going to make all this money. And you you will make money if you succeed. But as you mentioned earlier, most companies after a year don't don't succeed. After five years, there's even less companies. So it's it's a it's a game that the longer you're in it, the less likely you're going to be in it because something's going to happen. Uh, and it's trading like a nine to five, as people say, if for a five to nine, because um, with me, with my first company, I, I worked all the time. I didn't have any free time, hardly. I could control my hours to a degree, but I had demands. I had payroll. I had sales. I had things I had to get done. Um, so understand what you're getting into is the first thing. And then really dialing in uh, your what you're trying to sell and who you're trying to sell it to. Uh, I'm a proponent of the, this, the story brand framework uh, by Donald Miller. And I think it's a valuable exercise just for someone to go through the, the brand script, we call it. So you understand what, what you're selling and how to position it to your target audience. Uh, and you understand it from the perspective of the, the pain points you're solving uh, for someone, the emotional pain points as well as everything else. And if you don't have that dialed in, uh, it's going to be a much 
harder struggle uh, for your entrepreneurial journey. And for me, like with my first company, I just jumped into it and I didn't understand all these things. So I think it's important to really dial these things in before you take on a new endeavor. And that's what I did with this company, my new company, is I walked through that story brand framework for everything we sell to know what our messaging is, what the, you know, the pain points are, who our specific target is, what they're thinking, and how we can position ourselves as a guide in the story, not the hero. Another problem a lot of new founders and new entrepreneurs make is they want to position themselves as a hero in, this, in the story with a client. And really, uh, the, the client is the hero and you're the guide. And you're the guide to take them across the chasm, which is their problem. Uh, you're, you're not the hero. And, and that gets, it doesn't sell very well. We're just constantly saying how great you are as a company versus how great your client is and how you can help them solve this problem. So I think those are a couple of the, the main things I would focus on. That's great. And I always, you know, mentioned that you need to have a purpose. Uh, it's of course the money will follow, but if you put the money as your first target to become an entrepreneur, sorry, you are on the wrong path. It doesn't work this way. <laughs> yeah. So you need to have a purpose. And if you have the purpose and if you do it, you give, um, you know, the customer, uh, you know, what you promised 10 times and you put Really, really your heart in, into the business, things will follow. And you know, there are a lot, we, we can mention uh, a lot of things, but <laughs> we'll let do that now. But, but yeah, 100% on that, Christian. So, you know, Christian, where we can find more about you and, you know, the, the, the books and the offerings that you have? And I know that you have a course also as well. My website, uh, my personal personal brand website, ChristianEspinoza.com, has uh, links to my cybersecurity company, which is BlueGoatCyber.com. Uh, my books are on Amazon. Uh, the latest book, the ebook is available, and the paper, paperback is available. The audio should be released uh, in a couple weeks, the audio version as well. That's great. I will make sure that the links are in the show notes. Uh, any final thing, anything that you wished I have asked you, Christian, before we close? Uh, I don't, I don't know about anything specific. I, I think it's important anything you do in life with your business, uh, with entrepreneurship, your interactions to, to, to become, learn to be authentic and, and comfortable in your own skin. I think a lot of times we, we, we are afraid to be authentically who we are. And I think the world needs more authenticity. There's too many people trying to be like somebody else and not bring their own authenticity to um, any, any interaction. 100%. And, uh, um, you know, don't have an idol, but don't aim to become that idol because you will never become that idol. Just, That's right. of course, you can take the best practices. You can be inspired but you will never become someone else. And this is something I keep repeating. I write about it. I mentioned from the podcast and I say, guys, don't be, uh, I would say tricked by these people who write, Hey, if you do these five things, you will become that, that, that okay. doesn't happen because if everyone do these five steps and become that everyone would do it, right? It's not, it's not easy. And I always, you know, it's a little bit philosophical now I say Imagine always like we are in a space where you have the X and Y and the Z. Uh -huh. And maybe from it, when you do these things, you have the X and Y, but the Z is you. And the Z is always something different. So you are not the same characteristic of anybody else. This is why it doesn't work. So this is why I tell people, don't be tricked in that. <laughs> yeah, that, and that, that's, that's very good what you said there, because I, I think there's a lot of people giving you the, the how-to steps, right? Like you said, everybody could do these five steps and become a billionaire or whatever. But I, I think to attract, to get more, we have to become more ourselves. You know, that's a factor a lot of us forget. We have to do the work inside because our outer world is a reflection of our inner world, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, sorry, because I took this, the, <laughs> the slots from you, Christian, it just came to my mind is... Uh, you know, you you are you you have to be the 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 main player, not someone else. So you need to become the main person who's doing this. You, 
And otherwise, as I said, everyone can do this and become, you know, a billionaire, whatever it is. So <laughs> great. Uh, well, you know, Christian, I really appreciate this conversation. And I believe, and this is something, by the way, for the audience, you're going to start to see some previous guests appearing again on the podcast because I received a okay, let's do another episode. So I'm hoping, Christian, we maybe sometime our, our, towards Q1 or Q2, maybe we'll have another episode with you, a part two, maybe. Yeah, um, for sure. Because I believe, you know, you have a lot to share with us. Uh, and thank you for all what you've shared today. As I mentioned, all the show, all the links you mentioned will be in the show notes. And this is for the audience. If you are first time here listening or watching us, thank you for passing by. I hope you become a loyal fan like the other fans I have. Please subscribe, share this podcast with your friends, with your colleagues. And tell me what you think. And if you are one of the Noel fans, thank you very much for your support and your messages. And for your also feedback, I like to read every single email message you drop to me. I read them all and I take them into consideration and I change sometimes things based on that. And if you are also interested to be a guest on the show, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you have a story to tell, you have a concept, you know, that you believe Everyone should know about it. Again, don't hesitate. Reach out to me and we'll find a way to make it happen. Thank you very much for tuning in. We will meet again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.